Thank you very much, uh, Milena. And thank you also to Milena over there for bringing me here. Mm. Um, it's an opportunity after a long time being out of the academia to present. Um, so my presentation is very much the kind of um, hybrid uh, stuff between practice and uh, telling you a tale of Katekutu's hidden knowledge. Katekutu, it's a difficult name, I know. It comes from Tamil and Kate. Uh, is the ornamentation and the performers wear, and kuta means theatre or performing arts in Tamil. Uh, this is just something for you to read, because I want to emphasize that the um, domain of the performing arts in India is not at all homogenous. Um, that there is a very close relationship between what happens in the performing arts and the social reality people have to face in their everyday lives. And that opinions about what is art and what is not art and what is legitimate art uh, vary a lot among the Indian establishment as well as the practitioners themselves and their audiences. So what I try to tackle here is the dominance of mainstream Western knowledge models, uh, which in India, of course, are part of the colonial educational system. Um, preferred education in India is still in the English medium and also very British English medium. And everything which is taught there um, is derived from the Western way of thinking, and that has to do with the whole educational policies in India, which I cannot go into, but they affect, of course, also the performing arts and the way performing arts is being taught, if at all being taught. Uh, but it effectively bars subordinate access to what I call the public debate in between brackets, because I don't think it is public. It also denies them cultural dignity and material assets, including funding opportunities. So a lot of my work has been about access to. The social, cultural, economic, and political are, in my view, inextricably linked. I don't understand why people are still asking, is this political? Everything is political in the performing arts, is certainly. But we look, lack, for instance, or I lack, social histories of subaltern performance forms. They are invisible. And this has shaped their knowledge, the way they are, the nature of the knowledge they produce, uh, generate. We also have no theoretical frameworks. Being in the academia, this is a problem, that we cannot accommodate that specific kind of knowledge within the theories we use. Um, and they're mainly, I'm missing the kind of ways of including that sensorial and exper experiential part in our academic writing, because writing per definition removes experience from the discourse. I'm also missing indigenous authentic vocabularies to speak about our practice or know-how and about the aesthetics they produce, including physicality, viscerality, creativity, sexuality inscribed on subaltern human bodies that perform cultural labor. And this term of cultural labor, um, Brahma Prakash, uh, teaching at JNU University in New Delhi, uses it. I've been teaching there. Uh, in India, many of the folk art forms are considered labor. And that goes back to the fact that most of the traditional forms were caste-based in India. And in specific areas, that means low cost or no cost. So Katekute, it's a Tamil language-based ensemble theater in which the principal heroic royal characters, so as this one here, uh, wear heavy wooden ornaments. You see this is a crown, only part of it is visible at the shoulder ornaments. And they enter the stage behind a handheld curtain. Traditionally, Katekute was performed by men only, who played both the male and the female roles. It originated in a feudal agrarian society in which to perform was both a caste-based right and an obligation. So you could not say no to the performance. And that, of course, led to or impacted on the self of the practitioners because they had to fulfill servitude in a feudal society. 
all night performances are physically demanding because also of the the fact that they are all night, eight hours, and that the performers wear this heavy ornamentation. So again, this is considered physical labor associated with the no or low caste identity of the practitioners. Katakuta takes place in the informal sector, so we are not part of what is so nicely called here <laughs> the cultural industry. We are certainly not an industry. And I object very strongly against these kind of terms, which exclude on forehand everything which does not work on this kind of capitalist model. Uh, so these are non-elite rural spectators and patrons. They commission the performance. They pay for it collectively. We don't have ticket sales, but we get a lump sum for a performance. Uh, and that leads to the fact that these spectators have great ownership of the performance, which takes place on their soil. And in India, especially for people speaking the Tamil language and claiming to be Tamil in identity, soil is a very important part of our identity. I think here in Serbia you can recognize these kind of feelings. There is even a saying that the characteristic of the soil will kind of get into the community itself. So that soil and that idea that the performance happens in your space is very important. It leads also to the fact that spectators will walk onto the stage to make a donation to a performer or that the performers will walk into the audience where part of the dramatic action will take place. There is no official institution where you can train as a katakuta actor or musician. This used to be like a kind of apprenticeship where a young boy would join a company and learn the trades by copying and doing. Many of these performances continue to have a sacral purpose. And by sacral, coming from an Indological background, I do not mean ritual or spiritual. Sacral means that it is embedded into the world and the world is chaotic and violent. And the stories we perform, the epic Mahabharata, is a violent story about the killing between the fight between five brothers and a hundred cousins. And at the end of an 18 day long war, the hundred cousins have been killed and the five brothers come to power, but cannot relish the power after so much of violence and pain they have caused. At the same time, these performances and that kind of generation of violence in performance helps to kind of cleanse the community of the violence the community itself inhibits. And therefore, these performances, which are considered a kind of visual sacrifice to the presiding deity, are put up for the well-being of the village community. That doesn't mean there is no entertainment. They are very entertaining, especially also because all night there is a comedian at work within the epic structure. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of the performance is to kind of guarantee the well-being, the material and, and the kind of sacred well-being of the village community. That is very different from cultural performances as we know them nowadays within the Western world. Oh. Um, to illustrate the kind of nature of Katakuta's knowledge, which is my main interest, I'll have two examples of productions we did. This is a production of Stephen Krishna, who is a famous Carnatic singer. Carnatic is a system of music in South India. He's also a social activist, Magasse Award winner, who kind of agitates against the privilege his own Brahmin community holds over this specific now so-called classical art form, Carnatic concert music. Sorry, I'm always moving for speed. No, I'm, I'm not used to microphones and I'm... All right, never look back. All right, thank you. Um, so this was a collabor uh, collaborative production between Pira Zakwa, who's my husband, and a Kuta performer from a um, traditional family of performers. So he started when he was 10 years old. For him, that meant dropping out of regular education and becoming a professional performer. T.M. Krishna, his wife, Sangeeta uh, Siva Kumar, both are vocalists, and myself. Um, and this production featured both Katekuta and Karnatic music on the same stage. Um, this is rather unusual because both these two forms sit at the opposite ends of the divide between folk and the classical. 
Um, both forms, though, share the same kind of foundational musical concepts, technical vocabulary and conventions, but the application of that knowledge is very different. Also, because of the, the purpose of the performance is a different one. For Carnatic music, this will be creating beautiful music. And for a Kuta performer, this will be kind of pleasing the village community and ensuring the kind of beneficial status of that community. And this leads to entirely different soundscapes and different aesthetics. Um, I've taken here the example of voice and the quality of voice and sound and the language Kuta uses. It's a language-based theater form. Mark Kate Kuta as folk and Carnatic vocal as classical. So voice becomes a key representational trope of cultural and social position and power. And it helps to perpetuate the social distinction between these two Tamil art forms. Um, I hope this works. I would like to show you a small example of how Carnatic sounds like, but it is not working. Where is the... <laughs> Sorry. So Carnatic is a very sophisticated classical art form, uh, music form. Um, which is the, where the, the voice of the singer uh, is defined by something they call gamaka. And as Krishna says, gamaka is a kind of, they sing around the same tone, uh, but they never reach the actual tone as we would do in Western music. And that can be very irritating to an audience which is not used to that way of singing. Kuta, on the other hand, uh, is supposed and is actually loud because it is an outdoor theater. We sing in a high pitch because we don't use microphones. That's why I don't speak into the microphone. And we have to reach huge audiences which are sitting far away. Yeah. Yes, please. We have five minutes, so I'll do only one example. The Gamaka. Go to the next slide. How do I go to the next slide? There's only five minutes left. What the first one? Yeah, next one. Also, just one minute. This is the Kuta voice. Virutam and Kaboni Ragam. You hear the difference? modernized, its aesthetics have been modernized over the last 200 years. That means it has been analyzed, systematized, codified, politicized, etc. to shape this new kind of aesthetics. Katakuta theater has also modernized by wresting itself from this feudal performance economy and becoming part of the informal performance market. 
but its knowledge has remained tacit because rural performers had nothing to gain from externalizing and codifying that knowledge. It also does not lend itself easily to that codification and digitalization as we have noticed over the pandemic. And I would say here also talking about curricula, the moment you start codifying knowledge, it is also the moment you start commodifying it. So it is a dangerous element and we're thinking now about what do we do about our curriculum. So the knowledge is grounded in embodied sensorial practice and the capacity of this practice to renegotiate, refigure and generate new critical and often non-discursive knowledge in and through the process of the performance itself. Embodiment here, a little footnote, um, performers don't use this term. Uh, in Tamil, it is impossible to translate embodiment, so that is my need for different kind of vocabulary. Kute interviews multiple media to create semantic, musical and visual meaning. And these media cannot be easily separated without affecting the whole and without taking away the additional value of what the multi multimediality means. It allows for flexible handling of multimedia dramatic material to attune performances to the wishes of the village. The emphasis is on, is on flexibility, not on rules, and it is open-ended. The fact that this knowledge had to be flexible, has to do with the caste status of the performers. They could not afford to go against the wishes of the village and therefore had to attune their performances to whatever the village audience wanted to see. So a theoretical model, how then to describe eight hour performances in the absence of a written script? How do performers create these performances uh, on stage? So I have conceptualized this as a kind of in a hypothetical manner, there is an underlying framework of every performance, irrespective of the plot, and there is a corpus of building blocks which they fit into this framework. The framework cues whatever element, whichever building block is needed. This whole sits in what I've called the oral reservoir, which is a hypothetical construct, uh, and which is owned by the practitioners who are the active producers of this knowledge, but also by the spectators who are the passive recipients of this knowledge. But having this knowledge allows them to decide what is a good performance and what is a bad performance. The oral reservoir is a kind of porous, so it allows old material to disappear, new material, for instance, from the popular Tamil cinema to come in, but also material from adjacent literary and religious uh, traditions to kind of create additional resonance, which is then meaningful for the village audience. I have one more minute. So the principal goal of Carnatic music appears to be to articulate and communicate the aesthetic beauty of music. Uh, Krishna denies the religious content of songs uh, and the fact that they have any influence on his uh, singing. That is different for Kuta, and it, this is probably also a um, position he cannot hold. Uh, but in Kuta, words and music are kind of intricately and intertwined, and it is impossible to kind of tear them apart. Within Katakuta's aesthetic architecture, music and language cannot be separated. They are essential to create beauty and semantic musical and visual meaning for the spectators. And in addition, voicing the role musically and linguistically for Raj Gopal, on whose experience here I kind of is my resource. They help him to retrieve oral dramatic material uh, and most importantly to enter into character and that will be his definition of embodiment. Uh, so I use this term rather uh, than embodiment to enter into that character to the fullest degree possible and that is also something where Kut distinguishes itself from Carnatic music and from other theatre forms. This is not Mimesis, this is not the representation of a character, this is the being of a character. And in this way, Katakuta distinguishes itself from the Western representation in the Aristotelian sense of making theatre. It is about being here in this world. And Valentine Daniel distinguishes this being in the world from seeing the world. And seeing the world is what we do in the academia, where vision is only one-sided, but being is the experiential side of what it means to be a character in Kuta. Uh, in this way, 
If you remember the opening quote, Rajapal defines his theater as the university for the people who cannot read and write. And that university is an experiential university, which I'm missing strongly in the academia. And I hope that in particular the younger generation will work on a kind of alternative or new theoretical frameworks which can incorporate the subjective and the personal, because without it, we cannot do research. Thank you.